I'm Bill Russell, and I'm listening to Gospel Canada. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have one of my favorite RLDS historians, Bill Russell from the Community of Christ. We're going to talk about some, uh, some of his days at Graceland University and to find out that he actually coached Bruce Jenner, the Olympic decathlete, now known as Caitlyn Jenner. So that'll be a lot of fun. We're also going to talk about early RLDS uh, succession. I didn't realize that three of Joseph Smith III's children became prophet, and we'll learn a little bit more about Joseph Smith III. It's going to be a very interesting conversation, and uh, I think you'll enjoy some of Bill Russell's unique opinions. Check out our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm so excited to have, can I call you one of the premier historians in the community of Christ? You might be lying, but no, I, 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 um, <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think that would be okay. All uh, right. Well, tell us who you are. I'm Bill Russell, and I have uh, sort of specialized in Latter-day Saint history since about 1960, no, since about 1970. Okay, so tell us a little bit about your your academic background. I understand you're you're a, a JD, you're a lawyer, I mm -hmm. guess. But you, I know you taught at Graceland. Yeah. Tell us about all your degrees, bachelors, okay. stuff like that. I I uh, grad I, I took a, ma a religion major at Graceland undergraduate, and then I uh, uh, then then I got my Master of Divinity. That's a three year degree. Uh, from the Methodist Seminary in Kansas City. And I loved it. I mean, it's some of the best professors I've ever had. Lindsey Farrago in New Testament. Uh, I've often thought of him as the best professor I ever had. What was the name of that seminary? Uh, St. Paul's School of Theology, a Methodist Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. And I, 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 loved, I just loved it there. Um, and so I graduated there. And, and Grayson said, well, you know, we really need somebody to teach Bible and history of Christianity, and that's kind of your strength from seminary. Uh, come on up to Graceland and teach. And so I said, sure. I mean, that had always, kind of always been kind of a goal of mine to eventually teach at Graceland. Although early on, I thought I, I would love to be to teach to teach something and coach <laughs> at Graceland, but that, that now had kind of long left my my object my objectives by this time uh, i did i did coach cross country three times during my my career three times each for a total of nine years but that's just because i had a record running running cross country and uh had been pretty successful at it and so they they wrote me in <laughs> and, and uh the first time that I coached cross country, this is off off the subject. We're all into tangents on gospel tangents, so that's okay. Oh, oh, oh this is a tangent. <laughs> the first time I coached cross country was I came to Grayson as a freshman, and and the coach and athletic director said, Russell, uh, I understand you were successful running cross country at Flint Northern High School in Michigan. I would like you you to start the cross country program at Grayson. So I did as a freshman. I went around the dormitories, the men's dormitories, and. We got about five or we got about six or seven guys. Because right? you need yeah at least five. But yeah, yeah you need five at least seven. five. Yeah. And some meets I only had five, but 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 I think I had a maximum of like a six or seven. Uh, and then I did that for three years. And then my senior year, uh, L. D. Weldon, the guy who who later would co would would uh, coach Bruce Jenner, came my senior year. So I was able to back away from him. But the funny thing about it was uh, L. D. Weldon was the third coach that I had. Was I've had three I had three coaches. But I only I only considered him the third best. You know, my high school coach was better than any of them. He he had been he had been one of the top top three hurdlers in the country. And I learned how, even though I was a distance runner, I knew I learned how to hurdle from from from, from Norbert Radar, my coach. Yeah, he was just a terrific coach. Now yeah. wait a minute, were you at Graceland when Bruce Jenner was there? Yeah, he he was a friend of mine because we both talked about track. You know. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you coach him at all? No, no, no. He had he had LD while I didn't coaching him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I did tell him, be sure and not be, be sure, and don't underestimate the importance of the of the 1500 meter run, the last event in the uh, Olymp in the uh, decathlon, because a lot of times a guy who's good in the other nine events will just 
we just train for those nine events and then just try to get it out you know on that last event which is just 1500 meter and LD uh, he was always good in the 1500 meters at, at, and Bruce, was. Bruce was yeah mm -hmm. so whether or not my, my whether or not my may give me that advice <laughs> stuck or not I don't know he got the gold anyway yeah <laughs> one way or the other he yeah. got the gold that's all. Awesome. so then two times late, two times later I, I coached a team for three years and then I had other reasons to have to, to have to step aside. Uh, but, but the last time was uh, there was a guy coaching both the men and the women's cross country. And the guys on the cross country team were really pretty good. And, they, and the top number one guy went to the athletic director and said, we want Bill Russell to coach us next year because we've got a good team and he'll push us. And so, so I did it and uh, I pushed him. And they won the they won the district, they won the, con the conference and the district for the first time in 17 years. Wow! In, in, in that year. <laughs> so, so you're a, a, a coach champion, I guess. Well, <laughs> <laughs> at least uh, you know when you've got a. I, I had I had good people, good runners. I had four good runners. And you, they need five, but I had four freshmen, and usually one of the freshmen had to come through good enough. You know, to make it make for make a good score. Right. So, <laughs> so anyway, I, I enjoyed. I mean, I re, every time I coached, I ran with them. So really. I always used so it for my own, my own my own workout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would usually finish about in the middle of the pack. You know, because I was forty years forty years old. And <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that's probably a little bit off what you're, what you're wanting to ask me. But <laughs> No, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I ran cross, cross country in high school. Oh, so did you? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very familiar with the sport. My son, I'll just do a little bit of bragging yeah, here. Yeah, good. Um, he, he just, he's in, on an LDS mission in Montana right now. Mm -hmm. And right after he graduated, he wanted to do a triathlon before oh. he went on his mission. Oh, yeah. And he finished in second place. And it was wow. Olympic length triathlon. Oh, great. I was so proud of him. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And it was because of all the swimming and, uh, and running that he yeah. did. And, and he was a mountain biker, too. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, I never learned how to swim. So I've never done the decathlon. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've never done that, uh, that tri triathlon, yeah. But uh, I would love to be <laughs> qualified for it. I did run Boston Marathon. Really? And that was my best best ever. Was at Boston? Yeah. You could, did you have to qualify back then? Because I yeah. didn't have to. Oh, you did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, although I, I had just turned forty, so so the, the uh, qualification was was slower for the old old guys. But uh, but I, I was able. To, it's still like three and a half hours, isn't it, to qualify? Yeah, well, it was yeah three and a half hours to qualify. Then it had, it had been three flat uh, for for younger runners, right. but three fifty three three thirty for old guy old guys. So, but uh, yeah, I just love. I, I mean, that's why I started training for the marathon. I wanted I wanted to do the Boston. Yep. You don't have to say about the Boston marathon. It's just the Boston. I ran the Boston. <laughs> wow. So. I don't want to get too sports nerdy because I have a tendency <laughs> to do that. But was Bill Rogers there? Do you remember Bill? Yeah, Bill Rogers won the, the year. Because he's the last American to win the Boston, I think. He might be. Yeah. Yeah. So that was late 70s, early 80s, I think. Yeah, 79 is when I ran. And when I was, for, when I was uh, getting to the top of Heartbreak Hill, right. mile 20, uh, I, I heard over the loudspeaker somebody's radio, and Billy Rogers has won it again. <laughs> and I had six miles to go. <laughs> wow! But I still finished in 2:58. Oh, that's yeah, a good so time. That's so a really good time. time. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I had no idea you were a super athlete. That's yeah. awesome. Bill 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 Rogers came to run uh, like a 10 oh something in, in Des Moines, and so I caught a hold of him and I said, I understand that when I was at Boston in '79, when you got to the top of Heartbreak Hill, you had to crap so bad you had to make a decision whether or not to crap or to win the race. <laughs> he said, no, that's just a myth. <laughs> oh, I was, I was so, so sad that it, that was a myth. <laughs> oh, <laughs> anyways, wow. yeah, but anyway, it was a lot of fun. I, I miss it, you know, once I got to where I, I got asthma is what, 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 uh, what ended got me out of it. Oh, wow, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. Well, um, one of my favorite stories 
So you've been in the community. Of, did you grow up here in Iowa? Is that right? No, uh, my dad was a pointy, an appointee minister in the church. And so I went from Des Moines six years to Omaha to St. Joe to Flint, Michigan, and then to Graceland. Okay. So I, I was kind of around the horn because dad was a church, what they call a church appointee, but basically a full-time minister for the church. Okay. So you've grown up the, your whole life in the community of Christ yeah. or the RLDS church yeah. as it used mm -hmm. to be known. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'd like to do is talk a little bit about RLDS um, history. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse and I went to Liberty House today. Oh, good. And that was fantastic. It was Steve um, Smith your guide? Uh, Steve Smith is head of... Was oh, it? Anyway, yeah, yeah, I think it. I think it was. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that was astonishing to me to to learn was after Joseph Smith the Third died, which was in about nineteen uh, fourteen. Nineteen fourteen. That's yeah. right. That his his three sons were the next three presidents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, David, Israel, and Wallace. Is that right? Um. No, uh, the first one. Uh, the first one was Frederick. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, Frederick Madison. That's yes. right. That's right. I, I don't know why I was blocking on him, but one reason I, I, I'll just tell you my heresy right now. I think <laughs> I think Israel. I mean, I, mean, I think Joseph Smith the Third was just who we just who he needed. I mean, that's he, he did. I think he did a good job. In fact, some of the historians in our church, like me and Locke Mackay. Who's, real, who's descended from Joseph Smith, uh, really are much more appreciative of Joseph the Third than we are of Joseph Jr. And uh, so, uh, and then my view is, I wish that, but but then after Joseph the Third, I wish we had just forgotten about the idea of lineage. It's, I think it's, I think it's quite honestly a stupid idea. Uh, I mean to be blunt, blunt about it. <laughs> I mean, and look at look at the the, the, rom, the remnant church is one of the splinter churches that we've had, you know, in the last over the last thirty or forty years. The remnant church uh, wanted to have a direct descendant. Well, they didn't have anybody that was a direct descendant in the church. Uh, Fred Larson, who became the first president, was was a direct descendant of, of Joseph Smith. But his three sons, none of them were active in the church. And so when he died about two or three years ago, they finally just had to go pick somebody they thought would do a good job. And that should be the way it should be. I mean, it's crazy. It's cr I mean, I mean I, back in 1972 or so, we had a, a journal published at Graceland called Courage. And I, I published an editorial which said, uh, we have debated with the Mormons as to which is a better, better method of, of succession in the church presidency, you know, a, a lineage, or, uh, or uh, the, your, your method of the long, apostolic, succession. apostolic succession, you know. And so the question is not which is the best, the question is which is the worst. I mean, we could we could have the the old debate baits again and just exchange notes and and debate which is the worst. <laughs> I mean, and I, I'm really serious, and I don't know, I don't know which one, which side I would take. I mean, I just think they're both terrible. So um, how would I know what side, side to be for? <laughs> they're uh, both terrible. So in other words, we, we should have had you know when we finally opened it up, opened it up and had Grant McMurray and now Steve Vesey. Well, we should have opened the door to anybody after. I mean, Joseph the Third was good because he, you know, that, that because of the timing of it and and the location of the church. We were we were we were heavily located in southern Iowa, and and uh, Joseph the Third was just and, and plus plus Joseph the Third had not been he'd been raised really by his mother and not by his father. And he didn't know a lot of the stuff because he was just eleven years old when his father 11, died. Eleven and a half. Yeah. And and he wouldn't have known hardly anything that his dad was teaching, uh, and and so I think now again I don't have proof on this because we don't have we don't have much in the way of sources from Emma, but I think Emma, raised Methodist, married married this Mormon prophet, and then he's gone, and and he had things like polygamy that she detested. 
I think she raised his her son or her sons uh, from a more orthodox Protestant type of type of uh, theology, and so so I just think that uh, Joseph Smith the third was the kind of education he got fit their brand of Mormonism better for the Midwest where 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 things like polygamy and baptism with the dead and all, all those more wild things you might you might say in Mormon history uh, were not were not were not included and that was very fortunate in my opinion. So So can you walk us a little bit through R L D S history so from what I understood, so June 27, 1844, Joseph was killed. Um, the RLDS church was started April 6, 1860. Yeah. So well, it really was underway before that. Uh, it just, April 6 is when they, they got Joseph the Third to, to accept the presidency of the church. It really started in 18, uh, 1852 when uh, Jason Briggs went out into a, had his, had his uh, experience much like Joseph uh, had his, had his uh, vision in the grove kind of experience. But anyway, he went into the grove. Jason Briggs has a, has a visionary experience? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us more in, about in, that. In, I don't know about that. In 1870, that. He'd, he'd been, he had been uh, with Strang. In fact, I remember seeing, uh, I came across in the Strang literature uh, a letter from, from Jason Briggs and he said, this is in 18, 18, uh, 49, he says, I know, I know that James J. Strang is, is the one, you know, is, is the true prophet. Uh, but then in, that's in 59, 50, 49, but then in 50, they find out that, uh, that, that Strang is a polygamist. And so, <laughs> they were out there. <laughs> down, down he went. And uh, so, uh, so I think that, uh, uh, so now, he, the guy that he had put his faith in, was, was now a heretic, and a polygamist, and so he decided, uh, we've got to find you know some other basis for succession, and he he kind of settled on the idea of succession, I mean, I mean of, of uh, you know, what do you Lineal call it? succession? Yeah, succession, and so. Uh, so he came out of the out of his experience with that in mind, and so that's what he was looking for, and that's what a lot of the people who joined the church were looking for, was a was a man who was who who was, uh, uh, you know, of of the lineage of Joseph. So there's four sons of Joseph Smith, that and of course they want the, they want the oldest son, so they want so now they want Joseph the the. Uh, the, the senior jo senior the Joseph the third, and so, uh, but Joseph the third at first was very much against it. Right. You know, he he was aware of, even though he didn't know a lot of the details, he was aware of the kind of life his father had li lived, and he was in Nauvoo, and he was he was uh, uh, he was he he, he was uh, uh, <laughs> my Parkinson's hits me too too much. But he he was but justice of the peace in Nauvoo, and uh, uh, and elected elected a number of times, uh, and you know here you think you think with the name Joseph Smith and and everything he'd be hated by everybody, but I think because he was just a good guy unlike his father, the people around Nauvoo and in, in, in those environment the environs around Nauvoo thought this guy is all right. In fact, when, when the Civil War started, we need we need somebody to go make a big speech to try to uh, get guys to join the army, and so they said, Joseph, how about how how about uh, giving a speech to recruit some soldiers? And he said, okay, and he gave this gave a speech, and seventeen I think it was seventeen men signed up, and then after that he thought, what did I do? <laughs> I mean, you know, you begin to wonder. Is, is is this really something that we as a church? He wasn't in the church, but is this really something that we Christians should support? And he had he had some doubts about what he had done, but anyway, uh, he's, he's 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 just a respected member of the community. 
So uh, they had they had an RLDS church called uh, the Olive Branch in Nauvoo. Now Joseph, then when he finally finally accepted the leadership, he and Emma went to went to uh, up to Northern Elm to Plano. Wait, no, they went to Plano. They went to. Uh, Ooh, it's, 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 it's in the literature, but I can't think of it right now. But anyway, the two of them went up, and Joseph accepted the leadership of the church. And, and they were both accepted uh, as members of the church based on their, first, on their, on their original baptism. Right. So, uh, so anyway, and then, and then, uh, uh, so, but then he goes back to Nauvoo. And then he was in Nauvoo about five years before he finally went to Plano, where the church headquarters was at. He probably found it kind of hard to lead the church from, I don't know, 200 miles away or whatever that would be. So when it was about, about 1865, somewhere in there, he, he moved to, uh, to, to Plano. Okay. Yeah. So the headquarters of the church was Plano. Why, why would they move it away from Nauvoo? Was there still just too much hostility in Nauvoo? Is that, is that why? They I suspect Plano? it's a case of that might, that's, that's one possibility. But another possibility is that that so many so many of the members of the church were from northern northern Illinois and Wisconsin and southern Michigan. So they were just moving where the members. They were, were probably going where the members were at. Yeah, that's my that's my guess. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Plano was the headquarters of the RLDS church for how long? Uh, let's see. So if they're Plano until they go into Lamoni, uh, and that's somewhere around 1879 or so. So they're they're about fifteen years in Plano, and then they head to Lamoni. And so, from what I understand, um, a lot of RLDS members were saying, "Hey, we want to gather someplace. Mm-hmm. Where are we to gather?" Because Missouri was still kind of yeah, hostile. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a theory that I think is, makes sense. That that, uh, but I don't know for sure if that's the case. That they were thinking, let's get. I mean, I mean, Lamoni. First of all, we've got some people that have land. Our land. We got some landowners in Lamoni area. I get the the Bantas and and some others, uh, and uh, so so we did have a little bit of a establishment of some of some people there with 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 some some significant land ownership, uh, and they're just three miles from the Missouri state line. Or so, three or four or five miles from the state line, so uh, it was a pretty good place to land. If if you ultimately, so they end, they end up taking about twenty years to gather the independence. You know, they uh, from Lamona. From Lamona, yeah. I mean, people just began to move to independence by by about eighteen eighty or so. Uh, it's about a, it's about a twenty year proje- uh, process of of moving and. Uh, I'm not even real positive when Joseph the third decided to make the move, but somewhere around 1800, uh, about about midway through that that that, that, that gathering period, uh, he decided to move to Independence, and, uh, and folks kept on moving. So by 18 by 1920, it was clear that that the, that the church establishment, that the church headquarters was Independence. But I'm not sure how far before that it would be a matter of everybody agrees that that, 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 that that's it. I think they just saw it as a gradual process. And okay, so so the the headquarters. It's funny to me that there's so many different headquarters. So it went from yeah. Plano to yeah. Lamoni for yeah. 20-ish years, yeah. and then to Independence. Yeah, and then to Independence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so okay, yeah. that's interesting. And so he. It's amazing to me. He lived a long time. Yeah, he, he was 54 years, 54 and a half years, I believe it was, as president of the church. How old was he when he became president, do you know? Uh, Late 20s, I think? Yeah, about, about uh, I think about 27. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so, yeah. okay. So. And then add 54 to that. And he's pretty old when he dies. Well, ni- yeah, so 1940. So he was probably, yeah. Seventy years oldish, at least, yeah, at yeah. least, yeah. Yeah, well, Israel was eighty-four, I think, when he died by automobile accident. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so he's, uh, yeah, he, and that's an interesting story. I think uh, he 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 he'd been told that you know you're eighty-four years old and 
you probably, you know, and you're president of the church, we can find a driver for you easy. Anybody, you know, people have you drive the, to drive the prophet to, to a meeting. So he had a, a date to give a sermon here in Lamoni Stake at the Lamoni Congregation uh, to be the kind of the keynote of their state conference. And there was somebody who was supposed to drive him up, but he kind of resented that, uh, I guess. And so he just went out and got in the car and, started, and took off. But then it turned out to be a very rainy day, and, and his 84-year-old eyes weren't very good, and he ended up going across the center lane and hitting somebody. Killed him. It didn't kill those people, and they, they, the two people, I think, in the car, and they recovered fairly fast. A story I like, a good friend of mine uh, is a, is a, was raised on a farm near Lamoni, and he and his father, about the time he was graduating from high school, he and his father were at some 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 sale uh, south of in, in south in in the in the, on, in the Missouri border somewhere, and there was this guy at the sale. He said, "Yeah, uh, I I just about got killed by the Mormon prophet last year." <laughs> And these two RLDS guys were there. They probably just let it let it ride. But <laughs> yeah, because you don't, you don't call yourselves Mormons, right? Really? No, no. Yeah. Uh, see, Tom Harkin, our former senator, congressman and senator, I knew him pretty well from before he was a senator or a congressman. And uh, but the first time he was at Graceland speaking, and, and he was he was getting ready to run for Congress. And he 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 had uh, thought he had thought we were Mormons, and he read up on the Mormons and stuff. And he said, you know, well, you know, uh, I and he's, he's Catholic, you know, but not he's non-practicing Catholic. But he said, uh, you know, I'm I, I really respect the Mormons. Uh, they they have a very good work ethic, you know, and, and so forth. And they're, you know, honest, honest men and honest men and women and so forth. And so I see, see, he, let's tell the story and it's today. <laughs> so I get him aside and I say, Tom, we're not Mormons. And this is way back in 1972. And so I hadn't really been schooled yet in the idea that we really all are, are all Mormons, you know, because we're all out of that, out of that thing. And I said, you know, we're not Mormons. We don't even like them. <laughs> and so he still tells that story. Like he was at, he was at a fundraiser for a Graceland student who was in the, in the legislature. And I went to the fundraiser and he saw me and he goes over and he, and he laughed about it and everything. And, and he's told that story at, 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 to even today. At, like Bill, Bill Moraine, editor of our journal, he was at another meeting. And, and uh, Harkin saw Bill, got talking to Bill, and then he told the whole group about, about his experience. The Earl Russell gets me aside. No, we're not. We're not. Uh, we're, we're not Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> but still, but then as I get studying Mormon history, I think it's legitimate to say we're all Mormons. I mean, you know, we just, we have a whole, we have a bunch of, there's just a bunch of Mormon churches that have, that have developed out of the Joseph Smith experience. That seems like makes sense to me, but uh, I know it doesn't make sense to the guys at the 36-story building, at least the guys, the, the 15 guys that are in charge. <laughs> I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's, uh, that's their idea at all. Because <laughs> it, it seems like they, they, they are trying to say that you're, you're only a Mormon if you t take, the, take the whole ball of wax that the Utah church puts forth. <laughs> right. Well, are there any, because I know 1984 was a big year in our LDS mm -hmm. history with the ordination of women, mm -hmm. um, which was six years after the LDS revelation that allowed blacks. Mm -hmm. um, before we go there, because I think that's an important thing I want to highlight, are there any, what are kind of some of the big events between, say, 1914 when Joseph III died and 1984 when revelation happened are there what are the highlights of rlds history well um joseph i mean i mean the, the fred m smith the guys whose name i couldn't even think of uh fred m smith with his phd from clark university i think it is out in, out, out east uh in social in social psychology i think 
Okay. Uh, my view, he's not was not a good president of the church at all, uh, and that's because I think he was so. You know, maybe it's because of his PhD. He thinks he's so much smarter than everybody else, or or what. But at any rate, uh, he he had big fights with the elders in the church and stuff. Uh, and uh, so Smith, I mean, I mean, uh, supreme directional control. He, he he ultimately came to the idea that the, the prophet, you know, I'm the prophet. So you should you should do what I say, <laughs> and so the prophet we have supreme directional control in the church, and so uh, what I say you, people should obey, and that's just nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, uh, I think he was a very poor, very poor uh, prophet, and then uh, uh, so so that period from. 1815, when he when he became the head of the church, and then 1846 when he died, then that's that's the Fred. 1915. Yeah, 1915 to 19, 1946. Then then he dies, and then uh, uh, he hadn't left any kind of message as to who should re replace him, probably because the the, the only real. Uh, inheritor of the church is Israel A. Smith, and Israel A. Smith was in the bishopric that had fought tooth and nail with the presidency back in the 20s over Smith's record. Now, now Israel might have just felt like he needed to support the, the presiding bishop, and but because all, all three members of the bishopric quit, resigned uh, in 25. Um, and so then, then Israel Smith goes back into law practice. He was a lawyer. Uh, not a very good one, but he, he was a lawyer, <laughs> and uh, it seemed like he wasn't a very good one. But, but I don't really know, uh, you know, I don't know enough about it. But uh, uh, so anyway, he, but but he's finally Fred M. brings Israel into the presidency in 19, 1938, um, and he he makes a statement. Well, if he be, if he becomes president of the church. Then you'll have you'll have some some experience, and so six years later, Fred M. dies, and Israel A. becomes the president of the church, and Israel A. was a real nice guy. I mean, he, he learned from the mistakes of his brother. Uh, he he realized uh, uh, Norma Hiles has a good good uh, uh, title for for the book she wrote about Israel A. Smith, so, the Gentle Monarch. You know, she, he was a, he, was, he was a monarch. I mean, he was the head of the, he had the he had the divine right of kings in his favor, but he realized that that you've got to be a gentle monarch. You can't be a you can't be like my older brother who was who who, who really didn't handle things well at all. And, and 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 well, and in the middle of that, in 1925, a lot of people left the church, and and a lot of them joined the Hedrickite church, okay. and and some of them just probably left left. They had a thing where they would recognize the Temple Lot Church and the RLDS mm. Church would recognize each other's baptisms, right? Well, there was some kind of a around 1918. There was some kind of a, a study where where the people from both churches got together and and came up with some kind of a, 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 some a letter of, a, of of agreement or something. So there was there was some sort of agreement between them but nothing much happened out of, as a result of it uh, and the the, the, the uh, temple out church was just anxious to build the temple and I don't know if you know this but they got the they got the temp, the, <laughs> te the temple um, foundation they, they, they got the they got the whole they got the whole but, but, yeah. <laughs> and then they just ran out of money because <laughs> the depression hit yeah the depression hit yeah and so uh I don't know, after several years went by, finally the city of Independence said to the, to the Temple Lot Church, you fill that hole. <laughs> so they had to fill the well, hole. Well, because I've heard, because uh, the story, one of the things, mm -hmm. this is a great story that I love, is because Harry Truman's from Independence, yeah. the mm -hmm. President of the United States. Yeah. And so when he was leaving office, they were like, we don't want to look at this eyesore anymore. Oh. Fill up that hole. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know if Harry had anything to do with it or not. I think it was indirectly. I don't think he demanded oh. it, but people were like, 
when Truman oh, okay. comes home, we don't want him to see this big hole. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because that's 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 pretty near. I mean, his walk, his daily walk would often go past past the church. Um, <clears throat> One, one, one story that uh, one of our appointing ministers heard somebody tell him and passed it on was that somebody said that uh, they're walking down the street with Harry Truman and they, and they came within eye shot of the, of the RLDS auditorium and somebody said, now what, what is that building over there? And he just said, oh, it's just those damn Mormons. <laughs> 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 but uh, so yeah, he... he uh, yeah, he, he he went out on his daily walks. I, I, I lived uh, for a couple, two or three years. I lived pretty close to his house, and I kept hoping I'd see him. On his day. Yeah, I kept hoping I'd see him on his daily walk sometime, but I only saw him once, and it wasn't on his daily walk. <clears throat> it was Sunday, and we'd gone to church, and then my wife and I uh, had gone to eat at a little Kelsey's restaurant, which is right across the street from the Independence Hospital, which is just like half a mile or a little bit more up the up the road from Harry's house. Well, all of a sudden, a uh, limousine pulls up, and uh, the, 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 the limousine driver is driving Harry and Bess. And so Harry and Bess get out of the car, and they walk into Kelsey's restaurant. And there was only about four, five or six people there. I mean, being served. And they and uh, well, my wife and I were at one side of the little of this little restaurant. And and they 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 sat down at the other side, and nobody paid any attention to him other than the, the person that that, that uh, waited on him waited on him, but nobody went over and, and said hello. Nobody asked for an autograph or anything, and we didn't either. We just we thought it was really cool. We saw Harry and Bass over there, you know, and uh, you know, and I'm I'm a Democrat. I probably, I like Harry Truman, and uh, but I still. Uh, you know, didn't I just didn't think it was appropriate to go over and inter- interrupt somebody's meal? You know, so after a while, we but we waited until he left, and so pretty soon they finished their meal and got up, and went out and got in the limousine and went back home. <laughs> my my dad uh, really liked Harry Truman. Dad voted for for uh, Dewey in '44, and I just assumed I, I was I was a little kid. I just assumed in in '48. That he would vote for Trump for Dewey again, but at supper time, one of us said, "Well, Dad, who'd you vote for?" Well, I voted for Truman. You did? No, we didn't. Didn't didn't expect that. But he he, he really liked Truman. Well, I don't know if you remember when uh, a movie star named Whit Whitcomb or somebody like that uh, did a did a just a one man show when he just he just talked like he was Harry Truman, and uh, so my dad thought, well, he since he liked Harry Truman, he'll go to it. And he went to it, and then in the middle of it, he left and came home. And I said, well, "Why did you? Why did you leave?" He said, "Oh, Harry Truman didn't swear like that. Swear like that." <laughs> well, I saw the movie too, and I would, and I don't know, but I think, yeah, I kind of suspect Harry swore like that. <laughs> I, I suspect they, you know, they'd researched. Well, didn't it. they just call him, give him hell, Harry? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's, yeah, he's. Uh, uh, and, and you know, and, and, and G. Leslie DeLapp, our presiding bishop, knew Harry really well, and it said he, he was a big figure in the Democratic Party, in, in at least in the Independence area, and they say that uh, on uh, on election night of 1948, that uh, Bishop DeLapp was at Harry Truman's hideaway in Excelsior Springs, and I and I suspect that's true. I mean. He, G. Leslie DeLapp was very active in the Democratic Party, and uh, and uh, I suspect that's a, that's a true story, but I don't know. <laughs> wow! But DeLapp, yeah. DeLapp was DeLapp was well established in the Democratic Party in in, a, Decatur, in, in uh, Jackson County. Well, I'll just tell my listeners: if you ever make it to Independence, you got to see the Harry Truman Library. Yeah, it's yeah, really cool. oh yeah. And Lois and I just drove by it this afternoon. We did that when MHA was there a few years ago, so yeah. it's a lot of fun. But mm-hmm. Well, cool. Well, let's... Uh, anything else between, say, Truman and 1984 before we move on to 84? Uh, no, it's just, I guess I would say that Joseph, uh, there's a huge difference between Joseph the Third and his son, Wallace B. Smith. Uh, and uh, so Joseph the Third. 
uh, the old man, you might call him, uh, he was opposed to women in the priesthood. And, and in the 1970 Herald, he, he's interviewed, and he says, it's a, I mean, it's a terrible interview. It's, uh, he says, uh, uh, well, I, yeah, I, if you, my own personal opinion is uh, we probably shouldn't uh, ordain women. Uh, women are, are, are more suited for, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> taking care of the kids. And I mean, it was just that, that crap that, uh, that some, you know, some people will say about why women should be, be quiet and <laughs> shut up and, and, not, and not, uh, not, not take, any, to take any important role. And so, I mean, you might, you probably know Levina Fielding Anderson. She I do. One, she's one of my well, best friends. I know of her, but yeah. She, 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 I had her read my, uh, whichever chapter, whichever book this, that I talk about this, and um, which I haven't published yet. But anyway, <laughs> Levina said, oh, I mean, she just, she, I can't remember how, how, all the things she said. <laughs> but she was so disgusted with such a stupid, you know, statement by the, about women by the by the president of our church. <clears throat> well, then uh, by 1970, there's a strong there's a there's a strong sense of of a need in the church to, to ordain women. And every conference since beginning in 18, 1950, every world conference, there is some sort of resolution made uh, about women. Let, let's 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 put women in more in, in positions of leadership that don't require a priesthood, you know, we can go that we can go that far, you know, so forth. And uh, so, uh, of, and and then finally, I think in, I think about in 1980, no, before that, about 76 or so, a resolution from the first presidency says, "Well, we'll ordain women when the president of the church or the presidency of the church, I can't remember which, uh, say it's it's time, it's time for it." And I'm thinking. Wallace is against it. He's still the president of the church. And so the thing, I mean, much as I dislike so many things about Wallace Smith, and I can tell you some more things, but, uh, but the thing that I, that I appreciate about him is that he pretty much left, left it to his two counselors, Morris Draper and, uh, and, and uh, Dwayne Cooley. Uh, they were strongly for women in the priesthood. So apparently he just said, if uh, let's just say that if there comes a point where the president of the church or the first presidency want women in the priesthood, we'll go that way. Okay, so I want to make sure I have my Wallace's yeah straight because yeah. there's W. Wallace Smith mm -hmm. and there's Wallace B. Smith. Yeah, Wallace B. is the son of Wallace, yeah. mm -hmm. who is the son of Joseph Smith the third, correct? Yeah. No, wait, no, no, no. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And so. W. Wallace Smith, what, when did he serve approximately? Do you have he here? became president of the church in 19, uh, uh, 1958. 1958. That's David O. McKay years. era for our LDS audience. What's that? I said that's the David O. McKay era for our LDS oh, audience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he, so he served from 58 until when? Um, 20, 20 years till, till, till 78. Yeah, and then his son, Wallace B., See, his son is an eye doctor. He's born in 29. Wallace is, I think, I think he got a, just a, like an AA degree at Graceland or something like that. And, and, and Wallace was born like in 19, 1899 or something. It's, it's, so there's, there's three, three decades difference. And, there's just, and then there's a huge difference in their education. Uh, well, you know, like, like when I interviewed Wallace, he said, well, you know, I'm. I mean, I mean, as a as a medical doctor, we're we're interested in Wallace B. Right? Wallace B. tells me we're interested in, in in real facts, you know, and not not just not just. So W. Out. Wallace only had an associate's degree, but Wallace B. had a PhD. As it, the do, a M.D. MD, MD from um, University of Kansas, and yeah. Wow, that's quite an education difference there. Yeah, yeah. The, but, you know, I think that's one thing. I think the uh, Smith... So W. Wallace was the one who gave the terrible interview about women in priesthood. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I do think, though, that uh, 
one thing I like about, I mean, one thing I like about the Smith gang, the Smith boys, if you want to call, call, call them that, is I, I think they, they all, I think even W. Wallace va valued education. And W. Wallace hired, I mean, he, he appointed well, well educated, at least uh, men and late and more late. Well, he never appointed any women. Uh, yeah, yeah, W. Wallace. I think there weren't any women around yet. I, I think it was it was left to, to, for Grant McMurray to, to appoint the first women to the to to O. L. East to to, uh, to so, high position. So w. The Wallace was from '58 until '78. Yeah, and then his son Wallace B. Was president from '78, and he to '96. Yeah, 90, and he resigned in '96. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and turned it over to, to Grant McMurray. Grant right, McMurray, and so, um, so W. Wallace did he die in office or was no, he? No, no. He just uh, resigned as well. Yeah, yeah. That's I, very I think, different from when the LDS church yeah. you know, died to get out of the, to quit being prophet. And that's another good thing about W. Wallace. He, he he resigned rather than live. See, he lived until he was about '89 or something like that. You know. He resigned. I mean, he 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 he, he thought it didn't make any sense for him to keep on being the president of church. He, he hardly had any, any any life left in him. Was that a big deal or a big controversy? In not the really. No? Not really. I think most people accepted that. I mean, that's my impression. Most people accepted that very well. That uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense for a guy to be president of the church until he's ninety years old. You know, I remember when when David O. McKay got to be president of the Utah church. I came into my church history class that day and I said, well, there's a, the Mormons have a new a new president. Oh, really, really? Who is it? Well, it's David O. McKay. I think I got this. No, I, I got this wrong. David O. McKay left. Uh, David O. McKay uh, was the president and he uh, he's 96 years old. 96 years old, they say. Yeah, yeah, I said, but don't worry. They got a young cat. It's ninety-three. <laughs> Joseph Fielding Smith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, I think you know, I, I just think that for the RLDS, that that's uh, that, that that's one thing that that just didn't make sense, you know. Not. Don't serve until you die. Yeah, don't serve until you die for crying out loud. We, all of us, all of us want to retire at some point. <laughs> you know. Huh. We know. Was, was he the? Was W. Wallace the first to retire? Yeah. That's probably a better word than retire. Yeah, yeah, because Israel, Israel got killed in an accident. Everybody before that died, normal, normal death. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was Wallace B. Smith that presided over the 1984 revelation, which... Well, Wallace B. presided over the... Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what I understand with... So, 1984, that was that was a tumultuous year. Yeah, in yeah the a lot RLDS of people left church the church. Because, and, and yeah. because what I understand... One of the things, in an LDS church... You know, we have this thing about common consent, but it's basically everybody just raised their yeah. hand yeah. pretty thoughtlessly yeah. in a lot of cases, I would say. But in the RLDS church, you guys really hammer out and yeah. debate these things. And, yeah. and uh, so 1984, can you talk about that time when the, yeah. when that revelation came out? Well, so the, so the revelation, uh, it was fairly typical for the president of the church on about Monday or Tuesday of the week-long world conference to say, okay, I've got, I've got a revelation, and they'll send that revelation to each of the quorums. So the, you know, the quorum of presidency and the 12 and the bishopric and the high priest and the elders, and then, and then they just have a, a quorum of the, uh, of the uh, Aaronic priesthood. And then le more recently, we've added the quorum of members, the, the people who are just members but aren't, Aren't being any Isn't there a high council as well? But, uh, well, there's a high council, but that's not. Well, let's see, but that's that's not one of the quorums that vote on it. And so then they'll 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 meet in the morning. This is one of the things I've really publicly objected to. Uh, they'll meet in the morning, and uh, this this is changing under Grant McMurray and Steve Easy. So, but they they meet in the morning, and and, um, and then they'll vote. After after a discussion, they'll vote, and uh, and then they'll come in. And in the afternoon, there'll be a, a meeting of 
of everybody, all the delegates, uh, will meet in a general session that afternoon, and then they'll call on somebody to speak for each quorum, and they'll get up and say, well, the, the high priest quorum voted you know, unanimously or strongly in favor, or maybe the, uh, well, okay, in, in 1906, I've, I've looked through the 1984 votes, and the 70s tended to be the most conservative people. Uh, you know, they're out there telling people <laughs> the traditional message, you know, that we've been, you know, we've been te te teaching for years, and we don't believe that anymore. <laughs> and so they had, they had a, couple de a couple of quorums that voted, had a majority voted no, and some other quorums that was like tied, and then some other quorums it was close. So the, the, the real f interesting votes were among the, the the uh, 70s. Oh, now, there's other, the other quorums typically had some negative votes too, especially the elders' quorum. High priests, they tend to be more, you know, older. You'd think of, think of the older as maybe more conservative, but they're, they're older, but yet they've <coughs> been around and, and they, they're more, they're, they're a little bit more accepting of change, whereas it's often the elders. I mean, maybe that's a case of the elders. Uh, because they're conservative and opposed changes, haven't been ordained high priest. High priest yet. they're still elders, and they're voting no on uh, on the uh, on the revelations. But anyway, uh, it was a so so. But but in the actual vote, they never took an actual. I mean, they never took an actual vote, which I wish they had. But the vote was. Um, oh, people just have to estimate the hands. And then it was about about eighty to twenty in favor of women's ordination. I wish they'd had an actual vote because we could say you know the vote was X, X Y Z, uh, and because some people say oh no we really had more like forty percent you know and stuff like that, but uh, but I think twenty percent. I mean I wasn't there. So I, uh, I didn't go to that conference uh, except on the weekends. But uh, I, I had all kinds of grading to do at Graceland, so I didn't go down during the week. I just did the two weekends. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's that's uh, that's how how that that conference went. Some people, I, I, I have some friends who are restorationists now, um, <clears throat> who just left and went home. One of my best friends is one of the leaders of the restoration movement. And he's from New, he was from New Jersey, and most of the New Jersey delegation just Thursday after the vote got up and left and started for home, and so we had a lot, lot smaller crowd <laughs> during the later meetings. So I don't know if that gets what you're looking for. Yeah. So one of the things I know because uh, there was a lot of turmoil in the church in '84 over mm -hmm. women's ordination, and because I've heard. I don't remember if it was VZ or McMurray, one of the two, I believe, or, or even could have been somebody else, said that they learned from this contentious time in 1984 mm -hmm. that you can't just throw a revelation at people. Right. You have to give them time to discern. Absolutely. And so that, that in 1984 resulted in a lot of conservative members basically leaving <coughs> the, the RLDS yeah. church. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where I think the Joint Conference of Restoration Bishops or Branches JCRB, the, oh, several different groups. Yeah, there's and a, then yeah, there's the yeah. Uh, Remnant Church, which you mentioned. Um, that a lot of these groups were just like, no, we don't want females ordina ordained. Yeah. yeah. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Bill Russell, a Community of Christ historian. In our next conversation, Bill is going to give a story about Laban, and suffice it to say, he does not like that story. Is that? Uh, the story of Laban is a terrible story. Uh, it should never have been in the book of Scripture. It should, I mean, I, mean, I realize there's going to be things in the book of script, in Scriptures that, there's a lot of things in Scripture that are, that are terrible. You know, that we, should, we should realize. I think we have, a, we have a, a moral obligation to teach our children the things that are good from the Scripture and the tradition, in the tradition of the church. And we also have a moral obligation to, to teach to teach them that there are certain things that are really bad that we should avoid, and that's one of them. If you like what we're doing at Gospel Tangents, please support us. Go to gospeltangents.com 
and you can get full interviews as well as transcripts if you'd like those. So click here to subscribe and over here you can see some of our other great videos. Thanks again.